Hey everyone, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Alex McFedrin and I am a WHO consultant working on partnerships and engagement um, in the epidemic and pandemic preparedness and prevention department at WHO. And Kat, who just spoke, is also a technical officer in the same department. And we are very honored to have Father Tony with us today, who's joining us from the Philippines. He's the Executive Secretary of Cretas Philippines. So today we're here to talk to you about engaging networks. So next slide. So what we want to look at is why working with networks is important, our methodology, the types of networks, building meaningful relationships, challenges. The case study today is the Philippines and then guiding principles and best practices and then our key actions and resources. Next slide. And so our learning objectives really are first to understand the importance of engaging with networks. Um, it's it's a, a terminology that we're using and we'll go through to just understand what we actually mean by that. But we want participants to be able to uh, identify the key mechanisms to engage networks. And this is for health emergencies. This could be for vaccine demand, for really any health intervention. And the important piece for us is about complementarity. So we want to recognize the roles and responsibilities and contributions of different partners. What we've come to learn and, and we really have value is seeing what different relationships and a diverse group of stakeholders bring to the table. So we all have knowledge and expertise. And that's what we're really excited about having Father Tony here, who can share his expertise with us as well. And ultimately, a lot of this has to do with co-creation, which takes time, but there's more ownership. So we just heard when you were talking about the Slido that Catherine was leading on about feasibility. So this will come into play about what makes something feasible, what, what, when is their ownership? And that is from co-creation. And ultimately we want to illustrate how unique strengths and skill sets can meaningfully contribute to the same goal. So the definitions, because we use words like this all the time and we're not sure, well, what does this actually mean? So meaningful engagement with networks. So meaningful really means building and maintaining trust and partnerships and capacities and systems before a health emergency. It's really important that we have these relationships in place always in peacetimes and in crisis. And this sort of engagement needs to be sustained and trust must be nurtured. Meaningful relationships are committed, complementary, equal and collaborative. And when we're engaging, what we're doing is we're working together, we're collaborating, we're communicating, and we're co-creating solutions bilaterally as equal partners. So this isn't about delivering from WHO or from Gavi or CDC or UNICEF or other to people. This is about doing it together. That's engagement. And we all have the same goal, ultimately, to promote health. And what we realize is networks really enable us to do this. And how we define networks is actually communities. So this is large groups or, or communities of people who are convened around a common history, values, objectives, or interests. Networks are, are connected at the global, regional, national, local level. So there's networks that could be, you know, just globally understood, but also there will always be different groups within these networks that are working at all the different levels. So it's really valuable to work with each other in this way. Each network brings a unique contribution to health systems and health emergency preparedness and response. So for us, the important thing are these keywords, meaningful engagement with networks, and we'll dive a little bit more into that now. Next slide, please. So the problem statement is really what happens when many different stakeholders have the same objective to promote health or increase vaccine demand or respond to health emergency, but we struggle to meaningfully engage everyone who is both affected and able to respond. And I think everyone on this call will have experience of that. How is it that we have the same goal and yet we might not collaborate as efficiently as we could? What often happens when we don't do this is we have exclusionary, siloed or inefficient interventions. We may not realize that we cannot have a true whole of society response without a real whole society approach. And we may think that we have all the expertise and know-how as health professionals, and often we overlook the expertise and knowledge of local partners. We may waste time reinventing the wheel and repeating past mistakes. So when we are looking at this presentation, this is really the problem that we want to tackle, and we do tackle by engaging networks, because we don't want to keep repeating these same kind of mistakes, and we rather would look at being collaborative and seeing like the, the advantage of working together, especially when we have the same goal. So next slide, please. So for us, the keystone, so you probably understand the theory of the keystone. When you have an arch in a building, there's one stone, that's that red stone, that really holds it all together. 
All these stones are important. And to us, that, that means vaccines, that means public health and social measures, surveillance, laboratories, et cetera. All these pieces are really important, whether it's about health emergency preparedness response or vaccine demand. But the keystone really is networks and communities. And why that's important is that when something happens, when there's a shock to the system, whether that's an emergency or an epidemic, et cetera, the people cannot bear that shock if they're not included in the process. So we really need to make sure that networks and communities are involved in the health intervention from the beginning throughout and afterwards. And the really big piece here, which we know came up so much during COVID-19 was about trust. So trust takes years to build, seconds to break and forever to repair. And that's why building these meaningful engagement with networks is about building trust. It's really about building a relationship so that this keystone, this piece of the intervention is always in place and is always really valued and is a focus to all the other interventions. Next slide, please. So why is working with networks critical? Well, communities are where trust are built. So particularly in times of crisis and uncertainty, we know that people turn to those they've trusted over time. And that's often networking community leaders. We know that global networks represent and include large populations of the world. So for example, in 2010, a Pew research showed that 84% of people were religiously affiliated adults and children. That means when you engage in a network such as a faith network, you're including a lot of different people from around the world that might have similar interests, needs, concerns around the emergency, around vaccine demand, et cetera. Network and community leaders are also influential conduits of information and collaboration. So these leaders of networks are the influential glue that really hold communities together and the critical voices that help guide and lead people through these crises. And we saw that a lot in COVID-19. We saw that people, especially in infodemic, are looking to where, where is the trustworthy source of information? And that's often within their community that might be their pastor or religious leader who, who they've known for many years. Networks also represent the needs, concerns, and experiences of different communities. So for example, with the world of work, you have employer associations, labor unions, human resource networks, and these are very specific needs when it comes to, for example, COVID-19. What was happening in the workplace? How did the measures affect people going to work or not going to work? What was needed in the workplace? So looking at that network specifically lets us understand how we would tailor information, how we would make sure that the guidance is feasible. How does it meet the needs of that group? Next slide, please. So the types of networks, there's many more types than these three, but here at WHO, these are the three that we've been working with. So there's faith, youth, and health in the world of work. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit more about faith and that's why Father Tony's joined us, but this is really about a diverse group of faith leaders, uh, faith-based organization, partners, and faith communities of all different traditions. And we know that the faith community plays an absolute important and critical role in society and also in health. So they provide spiritual support, delivering services, increasing social cohesion, building resilience, and a strong, strong role in supporting the most vulnerable. For youth, we know that these are the young people are the future of tomorrow. We also saw the impact of COVID-19 on them, but also the innovation that comes from youth. We need to look to the solutions that they are expecting and also have that we can use now. And in health and the world work, as I mentioned, when you have emergencies of any sort, you really have an impact on people's health and their livelihoods. So addressing those key points and how they correlate together. Of course, there's many more networks that we can look into and work with and as we should. And the important piece here is that to navigate and kind of assess what networks are working in your community and how can you involve them. So the next slide, please. So our methodology for engaging networks is really about strengthening and engaging collaboration for emergency, emergency preparedness and response, but this also can be applied to vaccine demand or any other health intervention. As I mentioned before, we're really the first point is to recognize and promote a whole of society approach that has diverse representation. So we don't wanna leave one group out, nor do we want one group to dominate or anything like that. We want everyone to be represented and we're emphasizing here unity, equity, and solidarity. The second piece is around convening the network. Works. So if you're a large organization or agency such as WHO, you have the power to convene these networks and to make sure you bring people together so they can access trustworthy information and share best practices. And the third is around co-creation. And when we say co-creation, what we mean is literally working together to develop products, solutions, and, and webinars, for example. So these key communities can address things like the infodemic and that are guided by evidence. And what that looked like for us was having 
uh, communities of practice, which I'll speak to a bit more, where we really work together on what's needed and how will that be feasible, functional, and effective for those affected. And the fourth is engaging with communities to share accurate information and build resiliency to misinformation. So really for us, what, how it started is was that different partners were asking our team at WHO for information in response to COVID-19. So it's very important to be transparent and share this information with one another. Next slide. So building a meaningful relationship. So what are some of the steps? Because it can seem maybe a bit abstract, but it's very, very simple. The first thing is to do a stakeholder or network mapping. Who is a part of this network? And ensuring that there's diversity and broad representation. Once you've done that and you've mapped out who could be a part of this network, it could be locally, it could be nationally or internationally. You can have a bilateral briefing introduction. This could be online, obviously during COVID it was, um, to understand each other's work, your shared goals, expertise, and this is really an opportunity to listen and learn about the network members' experience, history, and knowledge. We might think that we, we know all about this network, but if we haven't worked in that space, then we might not. So it's important to listen and hear about each other's expertise. And I think this is really important that we recognize that these network members have expertise. I might have expertise as a health professional working for WHO, and so does Father Tony. He has a lot of expertise that I can also learn from as well. Establishing a modus operandi. So how will we work together? So you can discuss with your network, will you uh, have a agreed in terms of reference, will you uh, meet frequently, etc. We had to do due diligence, of course, as an agency. So it just depends on how it's going to be set up. And then you get to the nitty gritty, the best part, which is the work planning. So these are your shared goals, your objectives, your projects and timelines. Again, going back to the keyword of complementarity. So how can we use the skill set, knowledge, experience that each partner has to make sure that we're stronger and we're, we're, we're complementing each other? So for us, that can look like sharing from WHO's perspective, you know, norms and standards are guided by evidence. And for the faith partners, this is really about working with communities, trust building, um, sensitive, appropriate, tailored information that really addresses people's needs and concerns. And one of the ways we did this was establishing communities of practice, which can be useful. You can find a way that works for you best. Ultimately, we want to work together to change the world together. This is the big piece is that we're working on it together. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges we can have, and these are all something that can be addressed, of course, all challenges can be overcome is that each network has a unique context, infrastructure, and different needs and expectations. And all that means is that we need to be responsive and adaptive. So for health in the world of work, we work in a different way than we would with a faith network. And just finding out what works with each network and being able to change how you do things so that it makes the most sense to that particular network. The second is that Intersectoral cross-country collaboration is very complex. So when we're working with agencies, ministries of health, and partners, sometimes it can be challenging to link everything up, but it's very important that we always collaborate both with networks and our corresponding regional and country offices. And the third is that, unfortunately, sometimes community engagement and collaboration can be fragmented across time periods or health topics. And what we really want to do is build and formalize inclusive partnerships within the organization to create sustainable coordinated, mechanism, coordinated mechanisms of engagement long term. And this means our relationships will be meaningful. So maybe in the past, we've had fragmented interactions with different networks or partners, but now we really want to make sure that we sustain that relationship. And that means it's, it's consistent, as I mentioned before. It's not just during crisis, but it's also during peacetime. Next slide. So getting to our case study. So the WHO Faith Network, which maybe some of you have heard about, really started in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. WHO definitely had relationships with the faith community throughout its history, but this was the most sustained engagement. And consistently, we've worked with the faith group to really learn what, what they desire and need from us, what they are doing, and also vice versa, so that we can complement each other. This began, as I mentioned, with closed technical briefings in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So our faith partners were looking for information and how to respond to COVID-19. 
as you probably recall, a, a lot of impact happened with COVID-19 specific, specifically to the faith community. So we would have had closing of places of worship. We had concerns about vaccines. We had a lot of misinformation. And so the role of faith partners was absolutely paramount. So it was really good that we had started having discussion early on. This then moved into establishing different communities of practice. And these included research, developing a strategy of engagement, and also communications and advocacy. So you can see down in the, in the left of the screen, we have here some interim guidance. And what's really valuable here is that this interim guidance, which was specifically for religious leaders and faith-based communities was developed in partnership with faith partners. So when you're talking about the Slido, just at the end of the last section before the break, it's really valuable to do this with the partner that it impacts so that it, it, it is valid, it is appropriate, it is effective, rather than sending out interim guidance or any sort of guidance without having the input of the partner or the people that are going to use that information. And the second thing there is very hard to read, but it's actually the uh, strategy for engaging religious leaders, faith-based uh, organizations and faith communities in health emergencies. This strategy was published last year in November. And this is a really exciting piece of work. It gives us a tool so that we can collaborate you know, nationally and internationally and regionally with our faith partners in emergencies. And this came out of the strategy uh, community of practice. So it's really exciting to see that actually we, we did co-create something together that's fit for purpose, that reflects the needs, concerns, and expertise of all the partners engaged. So another, after this, we started to, if we go back up to my little timeline there, the, we had an ongoing expansion using Snowball methodology. So how do people come involved? Well, we learn more about new partners. Um, we, people find our work through webinars, we find their work. And so we have always been expanding this network. As mentioned, we co-created guidance, webinars, communications, um, and we've done a lot of key projects to strengthen this partnership. So in the bottom right there, we have have uh, the conference that was held uh, last year. So last year, it seems like ages ago. Uh, and that was focusing on national responses to health emergencies. So these are all big pieces of work that we've done together. Ultimately, in earlier this year, we formalized the WHO Faith Network. And now we continue with our communities of practice and some new projects. So next slide. So just before I introduce Father Tony from the Philippines, this is really an amazing example of what happens when we have all the partners at the table together. That's why engaging networks is so important. It's having everyone sitting at the same table, sharing what they can do together in response to health emergency or vaccine demand and so forth. So in the Philippines, in COVID-19, very early on, the Department of Health and WHO and faith partners identified ways that these religious institutions could support their communities during COVID-19. Working at both the national and local levels, the faith-based organizations and the government created a memoranda of agreement, which is really incredible. What's important with models of collaboration is that it's what we call tripartite. So we have your faith partner, you have your national government, and you have um, your agency. So if it's WHO, UNICEF, et cetera, all working together. And the, and the Philippines did an amazing job of this and continue to do this, which is what Father Tony is gonna speak to us about. So I'm really excited for him to share more about his experience. Um, so if we think about also the actions that were taken by faith partners, there was a lot that happened. So they had transportation services for frontline workers. They supplied food and isolation shelters. They lending their places of worship for vaccine clinics, adapting messages into plain and first languages and offering services or psychosocial support. And I haven't gone to length here in this presentation so far talking about everything that the faith networks can do and have done during this emergency and others, but they play a huge role in health service delivery. And so we're very excited to learn from them and partner with them. I'm gonna hand over to Father Tony now um, who's going to give us some of his experience and also to help us understand why it's so important to engage networks. Over to you, Father Tony. Hi, thank you, Alex, and uh, good, good afternoon and uh, good morning, uh, where, wherever you are in the uh, uh, part of the world. So I'm happy to share with you my, my own experience as a Executive Secretary of Caritas Philippines. So first of all, uh, in the Philippines, every year we have uh, a lot of disasters, uh, more uh, detrimental, no? more uh, devastating no? to our communities. So we, we continue to build uh, partnerships with our government, national and local. 
um, and then we have um, uh, made a, a decision that uh, this is uh, the business of all. Uh, it's not just the church or, or neither the government, but everybody's business. So building, organizing work is so important you know, to, uh, for the communities you know, to participate in the, in the response. Now, uh, with the coming of COVID pandemic, uh, we, we automatically uh, partner with, uh, with government um, agencies, local governments on the grassroots level. So it's like automatic to us that we, we, we right away sit down and uh, talk about uh, our response to, uh, to any emergency. Now in the Philippines also, we have three big uh, based organizations, you know, uh, the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches and the National Council of Churches of the Philippines. And of course, the biggest one is the Roman Catholic, uh, which Caritas Philippines is the humanitarian arm of, uh, of our Catholic Church. So uh, for so many years, we were able to build up trust with the uh, with our partners, with government agencies and uh, local, go especially local governments. Uh, it, it has a long history of partnership. Uh, for, uh, as, uh, for my my experience, I've been here for the last 12 years in, in this partnership. Now, two things are very important here that I, I value in the, in the engagement. One is the church, the faith communities have the credibility of people. And second, they have the facility, you know, not only in terms of resources, but in terms of structures down to the grassroots, especially the Catholic Church. We have 85 dioceses in the whole country, and we have thousands of parishes, and even thousands, hundreds of thousands of small communities on the ground. We call them grassroots communities, uh, basic ecclesial communities. And uh, the credibility, I remember uh, when we decided to campaign for a concerted response to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we need to, uh, to communicate uh, to our people through the churches, through our Sunday masses. And then we had, to, we had to convince our local communities about the value of the vaccines. So the credibility is so important, and we need to establish the trust, uh, not only with our communities, but also uh, with our partners. So this is very important. It is continuing uh, work, you know, building up, uh, making, uh, making our, our partnership uh, functional. You know? uh, so important, that's very important. You know? Credibility of churches in the Philippines in responding to emergencies like COVID-19 pandemic is very important and it has to continue to be built up, to be nurtured. Secondly, uh, 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 COVID-19 pandemic made us realize that the many years of work in partnership and engage, in engaging network that we need to mobilize our structures, uh, we have to mobilize our resources. So putting together all these resources made us uh, succeed in what we, 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 we did, you know, especially in responding to, uh, to health emergencies. So this is our experience. Uh, two important uh, reminders for, for me and for all of us, we need to continue to establish our credibility by responding to all emergencies every year, and then when we when we face a bigger a bigger emergency, and then we are used to uh, to, to, uh, to 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 face that challenge, and we perfect our partnership, our engagement in that way, and hopefully uh, we can also improve our facility in terms of responding to all those uh, emergencies. So these are. The, the learnings that I got no, in terms of valuing our engagement no, as church people no, to, to partner with our government, uh, especially the Department of Health, and of course, 
na WHO. The last comment that I have, we have also Caritas Asia. I'm hosting, we're hosting Caritas Asia meeting next week here in the Philippines. We will talk about also this kind of response to emergencies and we have Caritas International based in Rome. So these are, these are resources available and we value the partnership, vertical and horizontal networks that, that are available to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Tony, so much for sharing, sharing the amazing work that everyone is doing. Um, okay, so this is just the last slide um, speaking to exactly what you just said. So um, can we go to the next slide again? <clears throat> um, so I'm Catherine Sheridan. I work in the same team as Alex in engagement and partnerships as part of the WHO Emergency Program. Uh, I think we've got a few minutes left. So Alex went over the uh, what Engaging Networks is, why it's important, and a bit of the how, and I'm just going to take us through the last part as we cover some of the principles that help guide our work, metrics and evaluations, and some concrete actions to consider. So here we've got three guiding principles that guide our work, and Alex kind of already speaking, spoken to all of them, which is partnerships, listening, and two-way dialogue. Uh, partnerships, listening, and two-way dialogue, and mutual respect. So as Alex said, partnerships is something that is ongoing, something that re requires time, a concerted effort to build meaningful relationships, and this whole of society approach during response, but also during peacetime. So for two-way dialogue and, and listening, it ensures the relationship is not one-sided. Listening to the experience of networks, as Father Tony said, um, the context, what's happening, what doesn't work, what works, what information is needed, this localized information is so important. Um, and continuous conversation strengthens partnerships and helps, helps us to ensure our work is agile, responsive and appropriate. Um, and of course, mutual respect, recognizing the value of complementary strengths and different experiences. And I think we, as we saw in the slider just before the presentation, um, this was brainstormed about how important respect is. Uh, next slide. So this is fairly self-explanatory, but um, some of our three best practices is being open and transparent. So communicating frankly and clearly, acknowledging uncertainty and change. Uh, we saw all throughout COVID as the information was changing, as uh, more information became available, as we researched, as we learned more. Um, uh, sharing knowledge as it emerges and um, acknowledging the uncertainty and change. Being adaptive. So tailoring engagement to the needs and concerns of each network and the context that's most appropriate, being willing to change again as the circumstances evolve. Um, and the last one is being humble. Uh, meaningful collabor collaboration requires a willingness to see and do things differently, to be aware of other perspectives and possibilities. The next slide. So this one is about metrics and evaluation and of course we know the importance of um, this to help ensure our work is, has impact, it's effective and it's appropriate. We also know that measuring the strength of a relationship is not so straightforward. Um, so however, we've, de uh, we've detailed a few um, examples here or guiding questions that you can use for your work for you to consider. So not just activating, um, so the first one, are you routinely and systematically engaging with community leaders and networks? Um, not just activating when urgent, building partnerships in peacetime. The second one, do you have a diverse group of stakeholders in your consultations from the very start um, through each stage, so consultation, planning, design, implementation, monitoring. The third, have your strategies and implementation been informed by the networks you work with? As Alex said, not just sending out guidelines, but having consultation and using tried and tested um, strategies that are um, appropriate and informed. Um, are your products, guidance and solution co-created and co-owned? Um, and then have baseline, midterm and ongoing surveys to review the work that you're doing and showing increased in trust and collaboration um, and building this relationship over time. The next one, next slide. So um, I think maybe you've already seen this, uh, this slide um, on a few other presentations and it's um, about, we know that context and resources impa impact everything. Um, has the presentation gone? Just a moment. Sorry? They're, pu they're pulling it back, Catherine. Um, okay, you want me to wrap up? 
Sarah, uh, no, no, no. Uh, Sarah, uh, can you show the operating environment slide, please? Oh, right. you can. You just pinned it on me. Okay. Um, I was just using it as well, so thanks for putting it back. Okay, so this is just about the, um, the we know the context and the resources impacts everything. Of course, we can't do um, everything in an emergency with no time or we need to do rapid action, but we can we can start with small things and, in, and build from there. So, for example, the mountain bike option. Include local network members in health system and health emergency planning. Invite networks to have a seat at the table, be part of the conversation, ensure um, partners are complementary and everyone's aims and work. Collaborate on shared initiatives and projects. And then we go up from there. So if you have more resources, more time, um, convene networks regularly, develop joint, um, joint partnerships and projects that you can work on together, and document your work. Um, then going up higher to the luxury, the luxury vehicle, if we've got all the time and resources and capacity um, and will. <laughs> so we've got um, integrate the network interventions with your organizations develop um, from going into peacetime as well so um, processes that will that will prolong beyond emergency host dialogue days and conferences to document lessons learned um, and engage and expand from local and to local and national networks um, so just wrapping up to the next slide is our key messages. So just to summarize, WHO agencies, um, nations, partners and people need to work together to promote health, keep the world safe and serve the vulnerable, especially during health, health emergencies and engaging networks absolutely supports this work and enables this. Um, number two, networks are community convened around a common history, value, objective or interest. So of course each network brings a unique contribution con important contextual information um, and support in the emergency preparedness and response work that we are doing together. And the third one, building and maintaining trust, partnerships, capacities and system starts before the emergency, during and also afterwards. Um, emergencies must be sustained and trust must be nurtured as we saw in that bridge picture that Alex um, presented at the start. And so the last slide is just some resources that we mentioned during the presentation. And I think we may be out of time, um, but if not, we're happy to do a Q&A. I'll hand over to Tina to let us know.